Good morning and welcome to the AEW UK REIT PLC investor presentation for the three months of the period ended 31st of December 21. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated in the right-hand corner of your screen. Just simply click Q&A, scroll to the bottom, type your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. The company would also like to highlight the Investors Chronicle Alpha Research Note, which can be found by clicking on the Handouts tab and is available to view and download. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. And I'd now like to hand over to Alex Short, Portfolio Manion, Henry Butt, Director of AWUK Re. Good morning. Thank you, Paul. Um, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us for our quarterly results for the quarter ending December. Um, Paul, if we could move to the first slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so first off, as usual, I'm just going to do a very quick reminder on the strategy of AEWU. Um, so you will likely recall that we run a diversified strategy. So by location and by sector and by tenant, um, we are diversified. And that's for a couple of reasons. So firstly, we feel that that allows us to spread our risk across a selection of assets, currently 35 assets. Um, and also, of course, it means we're not restricted to any one sector. So we're able to view the whole market and select the assets that we think are likely to perform best. Um, we tend to focus on strong commercial locations. So, of course, for industrial property, that will largely be based around um, uh, infrastructure hubs, motorway networks and so on. And we really do like properties that have a low capital value per square foot. Uh, so just to give you a general feel for it, our current portfolio value is £69 per square foot across the entire portfolio, whereas the build cost for, say, an industrial property, which is at the cheaper end of the build spectrum, is probably closer to £100 per square foot. So we like that feeling of embedded value, and of course it tends to make it easier to move these assets into alternative sectors if we choose to do so when we're starting off low capital values. And the same comment goes for low passing rents. And of course, that's why we think we have been quite successful in promoting a rental growth strategy here. And um, we will come back to our sector exposures, but our biggest sector, of course, is business space, in particular industrial, where we have just over 50% of our holdings at the moment. Um, and the thing that we think sets us apart from a number of other REITs in the peer group is our dividend at eight pence per year, of course, split into two pence per quarter. Uh, we have consistently paid that now for 25 quarters, so all the way back to the beginning of 2016. Um, we believe we're the only REIT in our peer group that hasn't either cut or suspended its dividend during the pandemic. Um, we will come back to the level of dividend cover, but essentially for the current quarter that we're talking about now, uh, we are back to 90% earnings covering dividend. So pretty strong rates. And as we say, we're pleased to provide the consistency of not having reduced our dividend. In terms of the assets we buy, we tend to look for assets which have an initial yield of somewhere between seven and a half and 10%, and we are still finding plenty of assets that fulfill that criteria. Uh, we've had a couple of purchases during the quarter, and again, we will come back to talk about those in more detail. Um, average lot size at the moment is six and a half million pounds, and our average weighted lease expiry profile, slightly shorter than benchmark, but not significantly so. Um, and we think we get a pretty significant yield advantage on purchase in terms of having a slightly shorter lease expiry profile. And also it brings up lease events. So you get to rent reviews, you get to lease expiries and breaks and so on. And very often it's, it's those um, events that prompt a conversation with a tenant and allow us to lead into quite, uh, quite value added asset management deals. And the final thing that we look for in terms of investment policy to buy is limiting our downside risk. So back to the point about having low capital value per square foot, always having half an eye on the alternative use value of all of these assets, should we wish to migrate into a different sector. Um, on to the next slide, please. So this is a brief summary of how AEW looked at the end of December. So you can see the valuation at £225 million with 35 assets. 
And the initial yield has dropped slightly from the previous quarter. That's really signifying asset management success and, of course, working through rent-free periods that typically will go with putting a new lease in place. Uh, the reversion of the yield is still up at close to 8%. So, of course, in the estimation of our valuers, Knight Frank, who independently value on a quarterly basis, still significant rental value to come from this portfolio. And the vacancy rate at just short of 7% is marginally higher than we would like it to be. Quite a lot of space under offer at the moment, so you will see that drop back down. And um, Henry will talk about that in a bit more detail in a moment. Um, and it is just worth noting that when you include our Glasgow asset, where we have exchanged contracts to sell that property, um, you may recall that we are selling it with vacant possession. So when you include that asset, the vacancy rate is higher. And we are hopeful that the sale of that asset will go through in the next quarter. Um, valuation on the quarter up £7 million, so on a like-for-like -like basis, 3.5%, which is what has given us our strong quarterly performance again. Um, a couple of sales have happened, which again we will come back to with slides. Um, cash and debt available, slightly higher than we would like it to be. That is because we have a purchase imminent, which I hope we will be able to report to you in the next day or two. Um, post that purchase, you will see that we are just about back to um, full investment and to our debt position of 30 to 35 percent LTV. Um, our sectors on the bottom right hand pie chart there you can see. So as I already mentioned, industrial still remains our biggest sector at just over 50 percent of the portfolio. Um, office is also quite significant, and we've had some real success in our office portfolio recently, which we'll come back to. Um, and retail warehouses, we are increasingly splitting out in terms of our management process from standard high street retail. We've purchased a couple of retail warehouses, and they have been very helpful in terms of quarterly performance already, which is very pleasing to see. Um, a lot of recovery we're seeing there in terms of tenant demand and also investor demand, so very helpful. Um, sorry, I've just seen a question pop up. Ordinarily, we would take questions at the end, but just for the purposes of being clear, I'm just going to take this one quickly now. So I have a question. Please could I explain a reversionary yield in layman's terms? Um, that simply means that if you have your day one rent, it means when you get to your final estimated rental value, you are assuming that the rental value is going up. And at the point at which you can crystallize that increased rental value, whether it's a rent review or a lease expiry, which then prompts a new letting, that reversionary yield is the yield that you then have at that point. So I hope that is clear. Moving on to the next slide, please. Uh, so here we're looking at our dividend yield against the uh, peer group. So the peer group um, you can see listed there and AEWU consistently the highest yielding uh, dividend here. So currently, as you can see off the current share price, just a shade over 7%. Moving on again, please. Um, so for myself and Henry, as well as, of course, being very conscious of share price, the thing that we can affect significantly more is property level performance. And so we monitor ourselves against the MSCI benchmark. Um, you can see here that AEWU is in the dark blue bars and the benchmark is in the lighter blue bars. And here we've, we've listed out our performance on all of the various time bases that are available to us. Um, from inception of the REIT. So you can see on each of those bases, six months, 12 months, three years, and five years, you can see we have quite significantly outperformed the benchmark. Moving forwards again, please. And um, this is effectively very similar data now, but this time split into the property sectors. Um, and it's by weighted contribution. So you can also see as well as how each sector has performed, you can see how our allocation has affected this performance. So you can see that our choice to have a higher weighting to industrial has been very helpful. And equally, our um, choice to have a much lower weight to high street retail has been very helpful too. Um, moving forwards, you might see our retail allocation jump up slightly again of course because we have bought a couple of retail warehouses and we think this is a sector where actually there is some value to come.
Moving forwards again. And so here we have our returns against the REIT peer group. Uh, and you can see the um, AWU REIT there is on the top line. And you can see on pretty much every basis, we have fared very well against this peer group. So those are results that we are pretty proud of. Again, moving forward, please. And so we are, of course, aware that our dividend uh, slightly sets us apart from the peer group, paying the highest dividend and, of course, having higher dividend yield. And we, as I say, have done that consistently and we hope to continue to do that. And um, for almost all of the time uh, from the beginning of 2016, when we started paying that two pence per quarter, for most of that time, the dividend has been covered by earnings. Um, the one thing that we do find, though, of course, is because we very actively manage our portfolio, of course, the income stream can be a little bit bouncy sometimes. So if there's an awful lot of activity in the portfolio, whether it's sales and reinvestment or whether it's big new leases going through, that does cause the income stream to be sometimes higher and sometimes lower. And you can see that I've tried to set that out on this slide here. So, for instance, back in March 2021, we had quite a lot of cash that we needed to reinvest and we were choosing not to do it at that point, because if you recall, that was in the middle of the pandemic and it was reasonably uncertain. We didn't want to make poor allocation choices, so we were slightly slower than we ordinarily would be. And you can see there that the dividend was down at 55 percent cover. You can equally see that in the following quarter, only three months later, we were up at 107 percent. And that was partly some reinvestment that had gone on. And it was also partly some very significant rent arrears that were repaid following successful court action that we took against a couple of our very large tenants. And um, down again in September, but as you can see, right back up to 90 percent in December. And we are expecting to reach full cover at some point during this year. Um, I am cautious to put an actual date on it because there's an awful lot of activity going on in the portfolio, which is all positive. Um, things that will have quite a significant effect, the sale of Glasgow, unfortunately, the timing of that sale is slightly beyond our control because it is subject to planning consent. So that is with the local planning authority. Um, we're hoping that consent might come through as early as today. But of course, it will be announced as and when we have that news. Um, we are also very close to full investment, as I've already said, hoping to announce a new purchase imminently. And the other thing that has cost us slightly is some necessary capital works at our asset in Blackpool, which are service charge recoverable, but nonetheless, in terms of cash flow, have been a little bit costly. But all in all, we are a very long way through rebuilding our earnings, and we expect to continue to report good progress there. Moving forwards again, please. Um, so a very brief summary of what we think we have achieved during the course of the year and, of course, into the December quarter before I hand over Henry for a bit more detail on some of our assets. So first of all, we're pretty pleased with our NAV performance and we hope that our investors are too. So our NAV total return for the 12-month period at 27.5%. We've been very, very robust with our tenants in terms of rent collection and for each of the pandemic quarters, by the end of the quarter, we have reached 98% rent collection. And the current quarter, of course, is ongoing. Uh, we will be at the next quarter in March. By the time we get to the end of the current quarter, we would expect to be up at that 98% level again. Um, and as I said, we did take court action against a couple of our tenants successfully, and that has prompted a lot of our other tenants uh, to continue paying, and um, it's been very helpful, of course. We need to collect the income to be able to pay the dividend. Um, we tend to manage our debt very prudently. So, of course, we have a very cost-effective debt facility, and that is accretive in terms of our performance. We are very conscious, though, that you know debt in the wrong market can be very costly, and we have been incredibly pragmatic with the way we have managed it. So we've kept our LTV below 30% during the pandemic. We're now looking at going back to that 30 to 35. We moved to a rolling credit facility so we can draw and repay at will. Um, but we have managed our debt with very significant headroom on all of the covenants throughout that period. Um, we're diversified, as I said, that diversification, of course, allowing us to select the best assets and, of course, spreading our risk. Our vacancy rate remains modest. 
Um, and the low capital value allows us to um, move into different asset classes where we want to for a particular property. And then we've got lots more asset management deals coming through. So hopefully another positive year ahead. And I'm going to hand over to Henry to talk through some of the detail of what's been going on in the portfolio. Thanks, Alex. So if we move on to the next slide, please, Paul, thanks. So this just covers, this slide covers the performance um, this quarter, um, much of which Alex has already touched on. Um, a NAV total turn of 5.63% for the quarter. Um, some sort of headlines in terms of that performance are the purchase at Coventry, which I'll come on to, and the sale at Basingstoke, and um, that um, total return has been suppressed somewhat by a bit of cap, by a few CapEx projects that we've got ongoing in the portfolio. Um, the valuations have increased by 3.5% and that performance has mainly come from retail warehousing at 6.73% and our industrial holdings. In terms of those retail warehousing assets, it's our two new purchases at Shrewsbury and Coventry, which have performed well for us. Um, we bought them off good prices and the market has certainly been moving over the past six months in terms of retail warehousing. Uh, so we bought those at the right time. As I mentioned, we sold uh, Weller Warehouse in Basingstoke in November um, at a price significantly above what we bought it for and the valuation. Coventry we completed in November at 16.41 million, um, returning as an 11% net initial yield and at a very, well, a relatively low cap valve per square foot of 110 pounds per square foot. We've had a good quarter in terms of asset management um, there have been a number of deals which have completed across a range of sectors. Um, most notably, we completed a 15-year lease to Roxy Leisure at our new property in Bristol. That's a 15-year lease with RPI terms. We also achieved a £90,000 um, uplift in the rent at our industrial asset in St Helens. We completed a couple of lettings in um, Nottingham and Southampton on the High Street, which is good news um, given the pressures that the High Street has been under over the past two years. And we've had some positive rental growth at our industrial asset in Runcorn, um, achieving rents um, of £6 a square foot of passing rents, which were in the high £4 per square foot. So in all in all, a, a pretty strong quarter in terms of um, the investment side of things and sales and asset management. If we move on to the next slide, please. So this, this slide um, sort of revisits our success uh, in the industrial sector. Valuations up um, just north of 5% this quarter. Um, it's all really about derived demand, the consumer um, sort of driving the, the tenant demand for more, for more space, um, which is ultimately driven rents forward. Um, supply is, is still somewhat suppressed by ever-increasing build costs, uh, making sort of viability for new build um, more challenging. Um, and as you can see, that um, chart below just shows that um, the value per square foot of industrial assets is still significantly below um, what it costs um, to build um, industrial space. And that excludes the, the land acquisition um, cost um, where land values have somewhat sort of almost doubled in value over the past sort of 12 months or so. In terms of our strategy with um, sort of our high percentage weighting in the industrial sector, we can be fairly sort of aggressive with our tenants, um, making sure that sort of incentives are low. We can try and push out terms and not have break options. And I think what we have seen in the industrial sector over the past two years is we have seen some rental growth of 10 to 20 percent every three to five years. Um, prior to the last 10 years or so, we, we were not seeing rental growth um, like that at all. Um, so that really is sort of a, a sign that the industrial market is, um, is, is still moving fast and is, is a good sector to be in. We move on to the next slide, please. So this slide is just illustrative of what has happened to our industrial holdings um, since Q3 2020? As you can see, the value has uh, their value has increased from 78,000 to 108. Uh, sorry, 78 million to 108 million. 
um, and that's excluding um, South Kirkby and Western Supermare, um, one of which we have bought in that period and one of which we've sold. So that looks at the remaining industrial holdings in the portfolio. If we move on to the next slide, please. So this slide looks at the performance of uh, retail warehousing um, in our portfolio and sort of an overview of the market in general. Um, as you can see, our, our valuations have increased uh, by 6.73%. And that has been mainly in our two new acquisitions at Shrewsbury and Coventry. Uh, which, as I said earlier on, we bought off very good prices. In terms of sort of why we like retail warehousing, um, retail warehousing buildings tend to be sort of very well located, kind of on proliferal fringe city centres. So they're very good locations. And if the retail warehousing angle necessarily didn't work, you'd be able to move them into alternative uses, whether that be trade counter or more recently last mile logistics. So we feel they're, they're in very well located. They also have a typically quite low site coverage, um, more around 30% because of a high level of car parking. Whereas if you were to compare that with industrial, you'd be at normally 40 to 50%. So if in time your retail warehousing was to sort of move um, to an alternative use, you, you feel like you could redevelop them and put a large footprint on those sites. The rents that we've been typically buying off have been low, so we feel that there's some strong rental growth to come. And actually, if you were to move them to alternative uses, the rent would be pretty like for like with industrial and trade counter, but you'd probably see a, a, a yield shift, a yield tightening in terms of the use because trade counter and industrial are tends to tra trade off stronger yields. And as I said, they're underpinned by alternative use values and the new e use class order has very much lubricated the planning process, meaning we can move um, our retail warehouses to alternative uses if we choose to do so. In terms of the occupational outlook, we have seen a divergence between the high street and retail warehousing over the past two years. Um, that's mainly been because retail warehousing has been able to open and trade throughout the pandemic. And it's, it, it, it has traded very well. The types of occupiers as well tend to support um, sort of more everyday life rather than being sort of fashion brands and stuff which you might expect to see on the high street. And a bit like the industrial sector, it's all down to derived demand. If the consumer is there, wants to shop um, in retail warehousing where you can drive and park your car, that's naturally going to filter into occupational demand and rents. And more recently, again, touching on that sort of use class, um, those use class changes, People and, and investment managers are typically looking to bring um, alternative uses such as leisure and food into retail warehousing schemes, which um, attracts a bigger pool of shoppers, um, which is which is good news. We move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So this is our office asset in Bristol. Um, the valuation has increased around 11% this year, and that has mainly been driven by um, ERV growth. We are achieving rents um, now of around £30 a square foot. Um, the rents in the chart at the top are the average sort of weighted um, rents across the scheme currently. Um, we have an ongoing refurbishment plan here. Currently, there are no vacancies, but where there are lease events, we will look to capitalise on those and continue to move the rents on. So it's been a successful year and we expect that to continue going into 2022 and beyond. We move to the next slide, please. This is our property in Oxford. When we bought it, it was a very much a traditional office asset. We um, are, have moved it towards the medical and life science sector where there is a lot of weight of money chasing that sector in the Coventry, and uh, in the Oxford to Cambridge arc. Um, the rents here are in the mid-teens, but if you were to let this space as lab space, you'd probably be achieving £30 a square foot. And once you put a stronger yield on that, you're getting to a sort of exit value of capital value of around 600 quid a square foot. So we feel that there's a lot to come in terms of the performance in this asset, even though we've had a very, very good year. If we move on to the next slide, please. This slide just touches on a number of our disposals over the past two years or so. Um, Corby, we sold in the summer of 2020. And we sold this to an owner occupier who could get um, occupation of the site. 
um, with the tenant being close to lease expiry um, with an unprotected uh, lease. Um, Basingstoke and South Kirkby, I will come on to with slides. And Solihull, there we re a lease to um, the government, 15-year lease, and we then crystallised the profits and sold that asset. So for very strong performing sales and crystallising um, crystallizing gains. We move on to the next slide, please. So this is the sale of South Kirkby. Um, we decided to sell this asset because we renewed both the leases to the tenant R Dark Glass. Um, the tenant had been there for a long term time, but they were reluctant to commit to a longer term. So we felt that having renewed those leases, um, the value would trickle down with those leases becoming shorter. There was also uh, the view that there might be significant capex if the tenant were to leave. So we decided to sell this asset, crystallizing the bar profits um, when the market is very hot, achieving a uh, price 87% ahead of the purchase price. We move on to the next slide. So this is Weller um, in Basingstoke, which we sold uh, this quarter. As you can see, we bought it off £60 a square foot and sold it for um, just north of £100 a square foot, so almost doubling our money. Um, as I said, the market has been very hot over the last six months. We decided to sell this one, particularly because it was a geared leasehold interest and the access wasn't great. So we felt that in a slightly softer industrial market, we wouldn't necessarily achieve the pricing that we would in a, in a, in a strong market. We'd also renewed uh, the lease um, at above ERV as we had with South Kirby, so we decided to tip this one out and crystallise our profits. Moving on to some recent purchases, um, the sort of the flavour of these are mainly coming from the retail warehouse sector. Um, we bought this property in Shrewsbury, very much in the battlefield of the retail warehousing um, in Shrewsbury. Um, it's been bought off very low rents, um, which, as we've already touched on, gives us the optionality to move it to other uses, trade counter or last mile logistics, if we if we need to, and we probably see some yield compression if that was the case. Um, the anchor tenant here is Charlie's, who are very very strong performing um, B and Q esque um, garden center DIY store. This is their strongest trading store in the UK. And we're already in um, negotiations with them about renewing their lease, which is very positive. And that those positive conversations have trickled through into the valuation performance. If we move on to the next slide, please. So we bought this asset um, earlier this year. It is a large chunk of real estate in a very strong location um, adjacent to a lot of regeneration in Bristol city center. The tenants have been there since 2001, so you could argue that they're very much wedded to the location of the property. There's a high footfall here being very close to the bus station in Bristol, and we expect that to increase um, with alternative uses and regeneration um, coming out the ground around this building. As I mentioned earlier on, we have recently completed a letting to Roxy Leisure, a 15-year RPI lease. They are a leisure operator which provide bowling and i think it's referred to as the competitive social sector um and that is letting which is recently completed and we're very happy about it's also worth noting that we had a 12-month rent guarantee from the vendor so completing that letting for that expired um is extra good Finally, this is Coventry Central 6. Um, we bought this asset um, in November, um, returning a good income um, yield to the fund. It's got a strong tenant lineup with the likes of TK Maxx, Next, Boots, Oak Furniture Land, Sports Direct. There are three vacant units and we are in some very positive conversations um, with tenants on those units looking to bring in um, alternative uses, i.e. leisure industry and potentially some food. And off the back of those um, conversations and the retail warehousing market moving um, in the last three months, we've seen some strong valuation performance here as well. So this is a good asset providing exactly what we want on day one, but there's potential to add value in time. We move on to the investment strategy outlook. So 
I suppose our, our outlook on this is that the industrial market, as we all know, is still very hot. Um, the prime industrial sector, um, there's still a, a lot of money chasing that sector. Um, in the sort of secondary, more peripheral industrial markets, um, there's quite a lot of activity um, in the investment side of things with landlords like ourselves on Basingstoke and South Kirkby crystallizing profit. So there's quite a lot of opportunities there, albeit we feel that the pricing might be sort of too spicy for the REIT. Retail warehousing sector is a sector that we are obviously monitoring closely. Um, we have obviously recently bought a couple of properties in that sector and we like it. In terms of the high street, we feel that values have sort of stabilized a bit. So hopefully we might see some growth um, as the um, high street um, recovers over the next 18 months. Um, and the office sector is still a sector which is sort of slightly sort of on hold in terms of where it's going to go. But I think um, people are returning to the office. Um, and But it's going to be interesting to see what the impact is on values because we haven't seen office values actually really been hit yet as because of the uncertainty with regards to people returning to the office. So if I hand back to Alex to just cover the conclusion and a bit of press coverage. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. Um, okay, so on this slide, just for the first time ever, we've actually put together just a very brief summary of some of the headlines that have been written about AEWU during the course of um, the last quarter. Um, it seems that the ongoing positive performance and the fact that we were the only REIT in our peer group not to cut our dividends and to, have to strongly outperform um, the property benchmark has really been picked up by the press. So we've put a few of the headlines in here, and I believe that we do have a pack of um, the complete articles if anyone is interested to see them, we can certainly provide those. Um, also worth mentioning that for the second year on the run, um, AWU received the CityWire Award for the best performing property trust. So we're very pleased with that too. Um, that's an award that is based on property performance rather than Anything else? So uh, we're, um, an award we're very pleased to have. And so on to the next slide, just to make a few final comments. Um, so really, of course, we're very pleased with our NAV performance again. Um, the 12 month, 28% NAV total return, we think is pretty strong. And we're also very pleased that our strong rent collection has allowed us to continue paying that dividend. Um, in terms of track record, we think we are pretty good at buying assets that we can make money out of and importantly, selling them at the right moment too to crystallize that value. And Henry talked through a couple of examples of that. And um, we have got another busy year planned with quite a lot of asset management opportunities coming through, which we will of course keep you updated on in due course. Um, and of course, we would very much like to grow and we're seeing a market out there where there's a lot of our kind of assets that we really like that fulfill our criteria. And so if the opportunity presents itself, hopefully we will grow and continue to perform well. So thank you all for joining us and thank you for your ongoing support. And I'll hand back to Paul for questions. Alex Henry, thank you indeed for the presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of the screen. While well, the company take a few moments to review those questions submitted already, I'd like to remind you the recording of the presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed by your investor dashboard on the Investor Me company platform. Um, Alex Henry, we have received a number of pre-submitted questions. If I may, I'll just start off the Q&A session with those. And Henry, I think the first one is for you. Um, congratulations on the strong recovery of the share price. People are seeing the quality of the team and the portfolio. With Sapper leaving uh, Bubbett Hall. Is there any update on relets or plans here? Yes. Um, so the tenant, um, they, they rebranded or there was a, an assignment. They were known as Hydro. Um, they vacated on Christmas Day um, and we are already um, in negotiations with a tenant to take um, that vacant space. Um, which would involve some landlord capex, um, but it's a deal that we are fairly, fairly sort of feel encouraged about. Um, we were naturally marketing the space, um, knowing that the tenant was vacating in December, so we were ahead of the game on that one. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Henry. And uh, the next one, I think, is actually for you as well. Um, Oak Park, uh, Droitwich, what progress has been made with the space uh, the sitting tenant has withdrawn from? So this space actually we've let on a temporary basis um, for the time being, whilst we progress a planning application, a demolition application for the space has gone in. We feel that it's obsolete and we feel that we can we can move this asset forward and um, building new space. So that's one we're working through as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Henry. Uh, I think the next one is for you, Alex. Um, let me just have a little look there. Um, what have we got? How's the company seeking to grow income and capital um, or even increasing rates of inflation in rental agreements? Really the panacea many commentators believe them to be. Um, okay, so I saw this question earlier, actually, and I think the thrust of this question was around um, open market rent review clauses and leases versus indexation, so CPI, RPI linked leases, for example. Um, now, the vast majority of our leases, I'm going to say close to 100%, are open market rent reviews. That means when we get to a rent review date with the tenant, uh, we have landlord and tenant surveyors generally appointed who are looking at comparable market evidence of recent lettings to agree the new rent with the tenants. Um, that, of course, compares to something like CPI or RPI, where it's very prescriptive and it is simply looking across an index and working out what is the new rent that the tenant will pay, which, of course, in um, an economy where it looks like we're going into a more inflationary period sounds very appealing. Um, the one thing that I would say in practice about RPI and CPI leases is I have very rarely seen them without a cap and collar in place. So typically you will see caps and collars of something like one and three percent or sometimes two and four percent. Um, now, for instance, in our industrial portfolio, we have quite routinely captured rental growth of 30 percent from one rent review date to the next. And of course, if you have caps and collars in place, a cap of, say, three or four percent, you are in no position to crystallize that kind of rental value coming through. So actually moving into an inflationary economy, I'm very um, I'm very pleased with the position of having an open market review strategy across the vast majority of our leases. Thank you, Alex. And I think the next question is for you as well. The dividend remains slightly uncovered. Is this owing to the vacancy of the Glasgow property? If not, do you anticipate being able to cover the dividend shortly? Secondly, do you anticipate any difficulties in completing the sale of Glasgow? Okay, so a couple of different questions there. Um, I also saw that this got slightly wrapped up with a question that came in while we were speaking. Um, so when I referred to 90% dividend cover for the December quarter, um, just in answer to the question that came in later, that is for that quarter. And if we were able to go back to slide nine, we could see that um, we have put the EPS for each of the quarters during 2021, and they did bounce around quite significantly. You can see in the one, two, three, four, fifth column along headed EPRA EPS, the number in brackets in each of those columns uh, shows you the percentage of dividend cover. You can also see in the bottom of that column that for the year, our average dividend cover was just a shade under 80%. And um, the reason that the directors continued carrying on with paying the full two pence per quarter is because we were having such value add um, asset management deals coming through that they felt that on average, this is a portfolio that is able to continue supporting this dividend in the long run. So in answer to the question, we do expect to get back to full dividend cover. And you can see that even in June 2021, we were at 107% dividend cover. Um, there is still a lot going on in the portfolio. The Glasgow asset, of course, is having an impact on it. Um, the main impediment to the sale of Glasgow, where we've exchanged contracts, um, the condition for vacant possession has now been achieved. That is no longer a condition. Um, the only outstanding condition is planning consent, and that is with the local authority. We um, understand that that decision could be made by the local authority today at a hearing today. As soon as we have the information on that property, we absolutely will report it, and it, it will have a beneficial impact on earnings when that building has been sold and the proceeds have been reinvested. 
Thank you, Alex. And the final pre-submitted question, if I may, Henry, just address this one to you. Um, many of the new lease agreements over the period under review have involved substantial rent-free incentives, and in one such case, a very large capital contribution to the tenant's fit-out costs in addition. What is the total cost of the company of all these incentives, and why is it proving necessary to give such generous financial incentives? Um, I think it's fair to say that the financial incentives haven't really changed um, in the post-pandemic um, world from the pre-pandemic world. Um, naturally, landlords are helping sort of tenants out a bit more on the high street, um, which is a sector which everyone knows is under pressure. Um, but then at the same time, uh, incentives um, in the industrial sector have got smaller and smaller, um, with there being a finite amount of space and very strong tenant demand. So I wouldn't say there has been a massive shift in tenant incentives. Um, in terms of sort of, let's say, uh, most properties, you will have agreed a dilapidation settlement um, with an outgoing tenant. Um, and that money will typically be used um, to improve the vacant unit with a tenant coming in, um, and, or, and which would be wrapped up in an incentive. Um, in terms of the, the leisure sector, tenants typically take longer leases and therefore landlords are in a position because of the value add generated from a longer lease are, are in a position to give um, a slightly larger incentive. There's also noticeably quite significant tenant fit out costs um, for, in the leisure sector. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, but we're not really seeing that much of a difference between the, the post and pre-pandemic world in terms of rent freeze and incentives. Fantastic. Thank you, Henry. Um, Alex, Henry, as you can see, we've had uh, a number of questions submitted during the meeting itself. Um, if I may just hand over to you just to click on that Q&A tab and where appropriate to do so, if you could read out the question and give your response, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. OK, thanks, Paul. So working through from the top of this list, then the first question says, do you measure... Sorry, I've got really bad feedback. Thanks, Henry. Um, do you measure or estimate the vacant possession value of your portfolio that you can quote? Um, so in terms of vacant possession value, we always look at vacant possession value when we are looking at a new asset purchase. Um, then going forwards in terms of how we value the portfolio, of course, it's independently valued by Knight Frank on a quarterly basis. Uh, they will look at vacant possession value where they think it is relevant. Um, so you very often find on some of the smaller industrial properties that vacant possession value becomes pretty key because the owner occupier market has been very strong. Um, so the answer is we do look at vacant possession value. It varies depending on what the asset is in terms of the prominence that is put on that. It's not a number that we quote. The only valuation numbers that we ever quote to our investors are the independent numbers provided by Knight Frank. Um, the next question I have is, do we incorporate capital expenditure into valuations for EPC improvements? Um, in short, the answer is not explicitly at this stage, and this is an ongoing conversation that we're having with our valuers and is increasingly becoming um, a discussion topic across the real estate industry. Um, Henry is something of an expert on this subject. So Henry, I don't know if you've got anything you'd like to add here. Um, well, I mean, as we've said previously, we have, um, with having a share leap, it's fairly short Walt, we have sort of opportunities to improve the EPCs um, on a lease event, whether that be a renewal or a new letting. Um, so we kind of feel that we are on top of the whole NEES initiative. Um, and it's worth noting that all EPCs have to be um, at a C by um, 2027. There's a two year period to achieve that between 25 and 27, and then a B by 2030. Um, we are naturally looking to include green clauses um, when we are in renewal or regear discussions with our tenants as well, which enable landlord and tenant to work collaboratively um, in improving the energy performance of our buildings. Um, so we, we feel like we're in a, in a good position to um, to tackle um, this, this issue, um, so to speak. 
Thanks, Henry. Um, next, we have a question. In fact, this is a question that comes up a few times. Uh, will we be looking to come back to the market for more cash, considering that our share price is now sitting at a small premium? And um, the answer to that question is we would very much like to come back to the market. Um, the main reason, quite honestly, being is because every time we do a stock selection meeting at the moment, which is currently about three or four times a week, we are seeing quite a number of assets that fulfill our buying criteria and look like they provide very interesting opportunities to add more value to this portfolio. So we would very much like to do that. Um, we, of course, are presenting to you all now. We have another set of presentations this afternoon. Uh, once we have the feedback from that, we will likely make a decision as to whether that would be the right thing to do. So any thoughts on that topic? Uh, when we get to the feedback section later, we would be delighted to hear the feedback, please. And um, the next question, what is the cost of AEW's debt? Um, we are actually not permitted to disclose the finer details of the debt. Our debt provider is RBSI. I can guide you that the all-in annual cost of our debt is in the order of one and a half percent. I'm afraid that's as specific as I can be, but it's cheap debt. Uh, it's very flexible debt. Um, we have fairly light reporting requirements to the bank on an ongoing basis. So it's a facility that we very much like that continues until October 23. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Um, next question, what capex, capital expenditure are we planning for? It says 2020, I'm assuming we mean 2022. Um, the short answer to that is we don't have significant capital expenditure programs planned. Um, this, as we have repeatedly said, is very much a strategy of uh, collecting our income, keeping the earnings up. And um, capital expenditure almost by definition means that we're taking these buildings out of circulation to do some sort of extensive refurbishment program. So in this strategy, that tends not to be the right choice for us. Um, we often have small amounts of money being spent. So by way of example, on our office building in Bristol, which Henry spoke briefly about, we will very likely do um, a rolling refurbishment of the common parts there. The reason for that is because we feel that if we upgrade the common part slightly, we are likely to see um, increased uh, rental values being achieved for the office suites, but nothing hugely significant planned in terms of capital expenditure for the year. Um, next question, I'm going to hand over to Henry because he likes this subject, Henry. Yeah, I'll read the question out. Do you see data centers and or energy storage sites as part of your investable universe? Any opportunity assets here? Um, so just to think of a few, um, we have an industrial warehouse in Peterborough, which is next to a power station. Um, having carried out an audit of all the assets in the, in the fund, um, this one was flagged as a potential battery storage opportunity down the line. So that's fairly exciting and interesting. So that's something that we're bearing in mind. Um, there are tenant rule and break options on that property as well. So before we know it, we could be getting that property back and we could potentially move it towards that use if we want. Um, we also have two other industrial properties, one in Wrexham and one in Deeside, where we have a very high supply um, of electricity and that um, puts those two properties in a good position with regards to those alternative uses away from and more standard storage and industrial use. So hopefully that answers your question. I can probably move on to the next one as well, which is well done, another good quarter of strong performance. Other REITs seem to be looking at dark stores and dark kitchens, the new model of retailing in this area that AW has looked at or considered moving forwards. It's not something we, I have specifically been involved in yet. Um, I know that, um, for example, the car park in Finsbury Circus in the city has been bought by a last mile logistics um, operator and lots of um, city centre car parks in London particularly are moving towards dark stores and dark kitchens. Um, in terms of our sort of existing portfolio, um, most of our properties are doing very well in their existing use and our logistics locations don't tend to be in London and very central they tend to be more next to some good infrastructure and motorways and stuff like that so 
it's not a sector that I'm doing much work in at the moment, but that could change. And it's obviously a very, it's a growing sector. So um, watch this space. Um, and I would just very briefly add to that, um, the idea of things like battery storage and dark stores and so on, those are really, really useful um, potential opportunities for us to move properties into in terms of achieving asset management deals. Typically for things like battery storage and dark stores, you would expect to achieve a long lease to a pretty strong covenant. And then you see yield compression that gives you that huge capital growth. I would say they're likely that we will move assets into that space. I suspect it's much less likely we will end up buying, um, for instance, battery stores, storage and dark stores because they tend to be on long leases and because they tend to have very sharp yields on them. So a purchase not suitable but to move into for asset management, absolutely on the radar, yes. Um, okay, another question we mentioned uh, expanding, do we mean issue of equity or expanding leverage? Um, so sorry, slightly repeating, we would very much like to grow, we would very much like to be in a position to um, issue new equity and purchase some of the assets that we are currently looking at. If we do that, we are very likely to keep our existing level of, of target gearing, which, as we said earlier, tends to be 30 to 35 percent LTV. So it would be a combination of those two things, most likely. Um, I think we're near the end. Um, so we have a question that on our market overview slide, uh, there's a statement that the industrial market is showing bubble-like characteristics. Please, could we explain? Um, so the reference to the industrial market having bubble-like characteristics is predominantly because industrial markets have been so much flavour of the month for such a significant period of time now. Um, there's been a big expansion in terms of the provision of space. So you, I'm sure we'll have seen as you've driven along motorways, enormous new sheds being built all over the country. So the provision of new stock is one feature. Um, the ongoing tenant demand, of course, at this point remains strong. Um, and then the very significant yield compression as well. So industrial markets have increased in value very significantly. It's really the ongoing supply demand dynamic that we're keeping a very close eye on the point at which there is more supply than demand we will inevitably see values coming down and um, i think it's worth just stating here that we think the industrial market splits slightly into the very prime big box units that you see the likes of amazon and john lewis and marks and spencers and those enormous tenants occupying um, and the typically smaller, much lower capital value, well-located working stock that we hold here. And as a reminder, um, we operate here off a very low capital value per square foot. So our industrial values across the portfolio, I believe, are in the order of £60 per square foot. To build new units is probably more like £100 per square foot. So still value to come, but mindful that these things can change and where we think we've maximised value we really might continue to sell one or two out and reinvest. And then a final question here, do we expect to see the all in cost of debt to increase significantly from October 2023 um, in view of increased interest rates coming through? The answer to that question is, I think we will see cost of debt increase across the portfolio sector. Um, our facility, as I said, comes up in October 2023, so we will need to deal with our debt facility well in advance of that. The answer is we've already started talking to our existing bank and to other debt providers. I think it's pretty clear that the cost will go up significantly. I suspect not um, I think we're well placed to continue to get very cost effective debt um, and I'm hopeful that probably during the course of this year we will be able to tell you about a new um, accretive debt facility that we will endeavour to put in place. 
Fantastic. And back to the big question. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, and thank you both. Uh, thank you, Henry, as well, for, for answering so many questions. Of course, any questions that um, come through now or the, the team uh, didn't get time to review, of course, we'll review and we'll publish responses where appropriate to do so on the Investor Meet Company platform. Alex, before just redirecting investors to provide you some feedback, which I know is important to you, may I just ask you for a few final closing comments, please? Yeah, just thank you very much for all joining for um, for investing in our shares and for following us today. It really is appreciated and we are optimistic about the year ahead. So thank you very much. That's fantastic. Um, Alex Henry, thank you again for updating investors today. Can I please ask investors not to close the session as you now automatically be redirected to provide your feedback in order that the team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and is greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of AEW UK REIT PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's session. That concludes today's session and good morning to you all.